Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our guest today is Martin Gurry, author of the new book, The Revolt of the Public and the Crisis of Authority in the New Millennium. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Martin. Uh, hi. Maybe let's start with the the big term you use throughout your book that you kind of identify as the as the change we're living through right now, and that's the fifth wave. Can you tell us what that is? Well, the fifth wave of information is is a decisive feature of our moment in time. Um, industrial age institutions, and by that I mean anything from government to the daily newspapers, uh, are being battered. Are finding their authority pretty fatally undermined by a, an unprecedented torrent of information emanating from ordinary people, uh, the amateurs, the public wielding uh, digital uh, platforms. Uh, I call it a, a wave because when scholars have measured the growth of information from the dawn of culture to today, uh, the chart looks like a tsunami, looks like a tidal wave spiking up by the turn of the new century. The year 2001, for example, produced double the information of all of previous human history. The year 2002 doubled that, and that's pretty much continued along. Now, um, I call it the fifth wave because there have been four previous great pulses or, or waves uh, of information in the past. Uh, uh, each one of them sweeping across the social landscape and leaving everything pretty much uh, altered. Uh, the first wave was was uh, obviously the invention of writing. The second one was the development of the alphabet. The third, possibly the most disruptive, was the printing press. The fourth, uh, into which I was born, was the age of mass media, the industrialization of information. Uh, each one of these waves pretty much entail a reordering of social, economic, and political life. And my sense is that right now we stand on the brink of another potentially catastrophic reordering of society. And you mean catastrophic in a negative sense or just in the level of change? Would this be as as different? Is it going to be as different as the printing press made life, do you think, or as revolutionary as that? Well, as you probably noticed from my book, I really shy away from making predictions. I, uh, I was a government analyst, and government analysts are basically you, your prophets. You're being asked by the president, predict tomorrow to me. That works when tomorrow looks like yesterday, <laughs> but when you have discontinuities, which is, of course, what the president wants to hear about, he doesn't want to be surprised, um, it does not work. So I, I'm not going to be in the profit business and say this is what's going to happen. But it seems to me that in the past when we have had these, these great big pulses, uh, there have been reordering of pretty much from the ground level up uh, of social life, uh, economics, uh, and politics. Uh, the printing press being, of course, uh, the, the most obvious example of that. But, I mean, you can go back to the invention of writing and you had uh, kind of like a priestly, a Mandarin caste that was necessary to handle uh, early writing. And you can go back to the alphabet and you have the classical republics that couldn't have existed without an alphabet. Each change brought about a reordering. Am I, if that holds true, and I'm not saying that it will because I am not a prophet, but if that holds true, we are in for a very unprecedented reordering of pretty much every aspect of life. How can you give us some examples of how this is playing out right now in our daily lives? Like, what around us are we seeing today that's part of this fifth wave? Besides just kind of more information being out there, um, I, the fundamental issue that I, I am interested in uh, has to do less with the surface changes that maybe you're asking about here. You know how, for example. Here we are talking on Skype. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I can do that with video, and I have done it. The people who can be in Zurich, Switzerland, they can be in Lebanon, uh, in Beirut, Lebanon, and uh, we can speak uh, directly face to face. Literally, I can see their faces. For me, that's always been important. I hated the telephone. The telephone, I always felt 
left out all the important information, which was a person's face. <laughs> uh, so I, I could speak face to face and it, it's a very remarkable feeling. Google and algorithmic search, very remarkable. You, you have a question, out it comes. But my, my concern is at a deeper level, all these tools have uh, allowed ordinary people, the public, to gather in basically communities of interest. And that interest can be in you know, pictures of cute kittens or, or it can be in the overthrow of the regime of Hosni Mubarak or the occupation of Wall Street to protest capitalism. And uh, this public is now suddenly in command of what I call the, the commanding heights of information, the, the information sphere, and can erupt uh, into politics. It is no longer a passive audience. It is no longer somebody, a group of people who just stand there and support one uh, elite group versus another elite group. It is itself a player for the first time in history and has been very disruptive. Uh, that we, we can talk about the incidents, but from from the overthrow of Mubarak in Egypt to the indignados in Spain to the tent people in Israel to the Tea Party and the occupiers in the U.S., these are the incidents that, that I am interested in that, that I discuss in the book. Now, uh, as, as if you read the book, uh, you'll note that it's, it goes beyond politics. Every domain of human activity is challenged. The scientific establishment is being challenged in, on any number of fronts by people who believe in open science, uh, bloggers uh, have challenged a lot of global warming uh, of the, the, the orthodoxy. Um, there is a continual struggle between authority, domains of authority, elites that have been taught to believe that they own these domains, that they, they own this information. Because why? Well, because I spent a gazillion years at the university getting these very painful degrees, and then I spent all this time apprenticing in these institutions, and now I'm at the top, and I own, own this information, and suddenly a blogger is questioning what you say, and oftentimes the blogger is right, and you are wrong, and uh, there is a, um, I guess what I would call uh, a, a failure of the institutions to, to make a case for themselves in front of this assault from the public. Well, it seems like obviously there are two different sides of this. One of them could be that I talked to my journalist friends, the kind of elite people you were, you were mentioning and and I think that they would argue and some of them do that the accuracy is a problem with some of these, these divergent viewpoints that are out there and, and probably is the case or maybe, it, maybe you disagree that old school journalism was possibly more accurate in general than this new kind of uh, information sharing? I totally disagree. Um, my, my area in the government, I worked with the, uh, the DNI, what eventually became the DNI Open Source Center. I looked at the media throughout the world. Um, the difference was um, when you put something out in the equivalent of the New York Times or uh, Le Monde or El Mundo or whatever, um, you were a passive audience and you were told by the Walter Cronkites of the world, um, that's the way it is or all the news is fit to print, and you pretty much have to take it on face value because you had no alternative sources of information. Authority is basically uh, a function of monopoly. The second that monopoly is lost, you have options, you have choices, and um, there is a lot of, uh, let's say, um, mediocre information, un unanalytically sound information that comes out in what is called new media. It is equally the case uh, with with uh, journalism. I think. Uh, I think the institutions. It, this is a a very strange contest between people who are probably correct in their assessments of the institutions, which are failing in many ways, but who are not producing any kind of way that in which they can be reformed. I'm trying to think how how this is necessarily, or at, you know, at like a fundamental level, different from what's come before versus we just happen to be using kind of different technologies to do what we've always done. Because it's, I mean, certainly it's not the case that there haven't been popular movements or people organizing around shared interests in the past. Or even it's also, upstart, like things like Thomas Paine Common Sense, right, the which was an upstart. The Protestant thing. Reformation, um, where, you know, the elite opinion was shake it to its core um, and it similarly with the with the elites i mean i i think you know look at the way that people 
engage with information on the internet. Um, and and it certainly is the case that people are expressing lots of opinions in a much more public way than they used to because it used to be you know, prior to Facebook and Twitter and whatever else, you could talk to the people in your immediate vicinity but you couldn't kind of broadcast this stuff to the world. But but at the same time, you know, the stuff that they're talking about, it's it's not like everyone it doesn't feel like everyone's out there kind of generating new opinions and sharing them. It's that they're they're passing around links to the elites, to, you know, a Paul Krugman article or a a blog post from some popular blogger who may have gotten to be elite in, you know, a different way than than in the past, but is still an elite. So is this is there something? I mean, I guess what I mean is, is there something really different going well, on here? Um, I, you, you mentioned Thomas Paine. I actually think there are many similarities, and I, I don't know whether they're just coincidental or there's actually some kind of causal link in there. But I, th- I actually think that there is there is greater similarity between the public of the 18th century that that forged the American and French revolutions. Uh, that the, the group of people who essentially call themselves a republic of letters and exchange information about primarily in, in the European countries where it was very unsafe to talk politics about science and um, uh, data in general, geography, new discoveries and so forth. In this country and, and maybe the, the English speaking uh, countries, a little bit more of, of political theory. Um, there is a, that public was virtual. It was open to talent. It was not accredited. There were no universities that got you there. There were a lot more women involved in those than there were at, well, once the universities got involved. The, pro, the difference between then and now was that that was an elite. That was a very small group of people. Today, uh, if you just look at what happened in Spain with the indignados, one day you are uh, president um, Jose Luis Sabatero of, uh, of Spain writing – a wave of popularity. The next day, there are several hundred thousand in the street, people protesting your not only just your policies but the system uh, on which you on which you preside. Um, where did they come from? Who are they? I mean, it is a that sort of self assembly. That's Clay Shirky's term: the ability to self assemble in gigantic numbers and to maintain uh, a, a focus, usually. Against because these these people usually lack any kind of coherent theory. Yeah, you talk about the, the bandying forth of opinions. This is not about new opinions. This is not about new ideologies. This is about the public being able to gather in unprecedented numbers at the speed of light, uh, and and be against essentially batter the status quo. It is a, a very unhappy public, and it is that way if, if from Egypt to Spain to the, the Tea Party and the occupiers here, to Venezuela, to the Ukraine. Uh, you can go on to Thailand. I mean, it is all over the world. And it's a public that demonstrates certain um, similar qualities, a certain similar temper, and uh, comes from a very similar demographics. These are not poor people, by, for example. These are not uh, persecuted minorities. These tend to be university educated, tend to be fairly affluent. And yet they're very unhappy with the system that has made them this way. You write a lot about how uh, there's a connection between authority and controlling this information, which I think is both in terms of elites, whether or not they're state or not. If Walter Cronkite was not a state employee but still an elite or the state itself. In, in your essay on Cato and Bound that you wrote in response to v- Virginia Postrel, you write, to a degree that is rarely acknowledged, rulers, individuals and institutions depend for their survival on the authorizing magic of legitimacy rather than brute force. Legitimacy in turn resists on abstractions, divine right or the sovereignty of the people. Persuasive images embody these legitimizing abstractions. Ideals of authority are given shape in reality and even grace, offering a lucid glimpse of what power ought to be but rarely is. And When I read that, it was hard for me not to think about coming into DC and seeing the majesty of DC buildings and everything. and. and and everything the government puts out to sort of convince us of its authority. Uh, could you expound a little bit more about how this is going to undercut some of those things? Well, that, that I guess, is the, the heart of the theme of my book. Um, we tend to think in practical terms, we think of government as great big buildings staffed by tens of thousands of people. You think of authority, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind is maybe a policeman or, or a soldier. Um, 
But in fact, this gigantic edifice largely depends, and that is true in dictatorships, no less than democracies, largely depends on uh, the willingness of the majority of the people to accept its, its existence and to obey its commands. And what I think the, the conditions of the fifth wave have made possible is uh, an ability to erode that legitimacy because every time the government make, makes a mistake today, and that happens all the time for various reasons we can get into, but before, in the, the old industrial age, when you made a mistake, you either, if you were a politician, you could be you know, voted out uh, and the system was not implicated, or it got discreetly put aside and in the end people decided not to talk about it or they, or they framed it in a way that was, that was not uh, corrosive. Today, when the government makes a mistake, all these uh, waves of the public that I have mentioned um, tend to dwell on it almost uh, obsessively. In fact, government is made to be the sum of its failures. Uh, and that is very erosive of democracy. And that has happened uh, here and in, in, in all the old democracies as well as in um, authoritarian countries. This erosion of legitimacy and authority you talk about as you know this erosion of the legitimacy and the authority of the these big institutions or these elites, but is it is there a sense in which it's just a, an erosion of legitimacy and authority period, such that they're just that this kind of public popping up and being able to get mad at things and dwelling on things undercuts the possibility of authority at all, such that we kind of just smear everything out to the same level of truth value or lack of it, which doesn't necessarily seem like a, a good thing. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're there. But I mean, I think my concern is I, I, a, a figure I, I bring up in the book is the figure of the nihilist. The nihilist in my mind is the, the logical conclusion of the path that I was just describing of basically um, a public that is focused entirely on negation on denial, on, on repudiation, uh, on, on criticizing without feeling incumbent upon itself to, to propose alternatives. And the nihilist, very simply, is the person who believes that the destruction of the status quo is a step forward. It's progress. You don't have to go up with an alternative. Uh, and that person has, you know, you can, you can get hint, hints and glimpses of that person today. Uh, and if you read um, some of the pronounce, uh, pronouncements and the, the proclamations and some of the demonstrations that, that have you know, erupted around the world, you get you can get hits and signs, but we're not quite there yet. But uh, my concern is that is the direction we're headed in. So, as a concern, though, because that's that's where I see some criticism here, um, uh, you of the blogosphere that we are living in a world now where people have increasingly private facts, pri private knowledge, entirely private opinions about various things, whether they're. Uh, you know, David Icke, lizard people believers, or vaccine skeptics, or the global warming sides. For you mentioned that previously, right. there's just they each think that they're the other side is completely insane. So does that make the the populace sort of ungovernable on this on some level? If they just are, they, there's nothing where they can meet in the middle. Um, you know, I actually think as long as you have these communities of interest kind of rolling along uh, with their little obsessions, um, whether they're governable or not, uh, it, you can survive. My concern is much that it, it's much more that every once in a while you get um, some spark, and that spark that's a pretty mysterious thing. What causes that spark? Okay, um, and I don't think it's predictable, but it suddenly becomes a, a shared point of reference where. Uh, whole lot of these communities that you were just mentioning cohere into a group and they're all angry at authority in a very united and, and, and very uh, antagonistic way. Uh, and then suddenly there are you know, 300,000 people on the streets of uh, Madrid or uh, Tahrir Square in Egypt or in Rothschild Boulevard in, in Tel Aviv, anywhere. And, and suddenly the government is presented with this, this, this problem of you know, how, how do you deal with... Um, Exercising authority, uh, the, the, the will to command, when uh, basically the public is less and less willing to obey. Do you think this is an extension of 20th century sort of postmodern thought to something or just a continuation of it? Because thinking about how 
different institutions, different writers in the 60s, for example, like Howard Zinn came in to say that the people's history of the United States was much worse than everyone, George Washington throwing a silver dollar across the Potomac mm -hmm. and all these myths about how great these people were. And that's a lot of what the 60s radicals were doing. America is not as great. The, the myth, the narrative is, is wrong. And that's been a big progression of, of a lot of movies and literature in the post-war era, maybe all of us being a little bit pessimistic after World War II or whatever you want to chalk it up to. And now we're just it, now we're just ramped that up on steroids and gave everyone a smartphone to figure out their own little narrative uh, against the, the prevailing myth. Well, I mean, I, I'm a 1960s guy um, and I, I, I lived through a, a whole lot of that. And there was a whole lot of crap being thrown around in those days, no question about it. Um, but I... I I, I think the situation is, is somewhat different than that. I, I, th I think the situation is, is, is more that as long as you control the means of communication, which in the industrial age, the elites totally did. I mean, when I grew up, I had literally, I, I don't know, how, long, how, how old are you guys? Let me, let me ask you that. In our early 30s. Mid 30s. Uh, okay. mid -30s. As of yesterday, yes. <laughs> You guys have – oh, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you guys have no clue. Um, I grew up with three channels in television and that was it. OK. That was what there was. When Walter Cronkite told me that's the way it is for this particular day after having given me, what, 25 minutes with three reports mostly of pictures and the entire world had unrolled for those 24 hours and that was all there was, those three reports, all I could do was turn to other two channels who gave me more or less the same thing only – in a lot less magisterial way, okay? Um, as long as you, you have the control of the means of communications, you can maintain your narratives uh, that, that legitimize authority. And that's true for government, that's true for even dictatorial governments, but of course it is true for democracy. And the problem comes when you lose your monopoly of information, uh, when there's an alternative voice that says, no, that's not the way it is. That there's a very different world out there from the one that, that you are telling us. And I think what progressively with uh, the fifth wave, under the conditions of the fifth wave of information, more and more voices have been saying, no, no, no. And every once in a while, these voices cohere into a, a very large public of opposition that can self-assemble and can essentially um, overthrow uh, established regimes. And, and – um, Every narrative is, uh, is, is a mixture of, of facts and, and you said myth, but no, it's, it's, it's really speculation, all right? So if you, are, if you are Osama bin Laden way back when and you say, well, why has Islam declined? Well, the decline is given. That's a fact. He, he accepts that. Then he says, well, I think it's because we're not as, as faithful to Islam as we used to be. Well, that's speculation. So you look at that and you say, well, he's right about the history part. But the rest of it seems bizarre. Why would it? So if you're inside of a narrative, the speculative part of it, I guess you would call it a myth, is very easy to shoot down. And I think that, that is what you have. If you have a monopoly, it doesn't happen. If you have the fifth wave of information where the public basically commands the means of communication, it not only happens, but it happens ferociously. Uh, there's a love uh, of, of knocking down the other guy's narrative. And as you, you know, when I was a young man, I always felt that the best way to, to learn about a religion was from another religion's point of view. Uh, all the warts come out, right? Uh, well, I think that's, that, that's what happens when you, when you have this, this condition. You, every narrative in the end is made to seem absurd and, and collapses under its own weight. And that does seem very, though, in the postmodern vein, at least, of the of being suspicious of narratives that are just sort of told to keep the powerful in power or or keep some elite uh, in the elite status. That's the point of a narrative. See, I don't believe that. No, I, I, number one, I, I I really don't like terms like postmodernism, partly because I don't understand them, <laughs> but but mostly because. They sort of are laden with with judgmentalisms, and and um, I I actually think narratives are are essential to human life. Every that is the way we communicate information the most effectively. Like I said, I studied this, and and it, it's it's uh, actually demonstrable that if I start sh uh, throwing numbers at you, pretty soon your eyes are going to cross, and you're gonna stop listening to me. 
But if I tell you once upon a time, I got you. You're mm-hmm. paying attention. And I will can put something equivalent to the numbers I wanted to give you in that once upon a time story. And you'll get it. Okay. And you know, all the great uh, civilizations, all the great governments, you know, systems of governments, all the great religions, they depend on stories. And I don't think that's necessarily, um, I mean, and, and you, when you look at yourself and you wake up in the morning, you tell a story about yourself. I'm this kind of a person, right? And, and you kind of aspire to, to, to the, the, the story that you tell yourself. It's not necessarily something manipulative. It can be, but it's not necessarily. It's necessary. Uh, and if you, if, if, in a world devoid of narratives, I'm not sure what that would, what it would look like. It would look like a world devoid of, of uh, organization. Is that the world we're heading to, though? Because you've what you've described is you know the 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 publics like to knock down narratives. That's what right. that's what these groups seem to do. And even if I don't participate in in that knocking down, if I see enough of it over and over and over again, I'm going to start to become very skeptical about the next narrative that comes along. Yet at the same time, and I think you're right, narratives are an extremely central feature of human beings. It's it's how we think about the world. It's how we think about our lives. So does this kind of explosion of information and decentralizing of authority mean that the world then is, is moving in a direction that's not really compatible with us? I think we're moving to, to a world that uh, – in which it's going to be very difficult to manage uh, structures uh, of command and control. It's going to be very different, difficult to organize, for example, a democratic vote. It's going to be very difficult to uh, somehow come up with compromises between opposing points of view um, because all those things happen within shared narratives. I mean, the democracy has a large narrative itself. The American narrative, for example, I mean, if you want to talk about a speculative or a mythical narrative, <laughs> talks about the fact that we are all equal. Well, okay, I, I, I'm a big baseball fan, and I look at Bryce Harper, and I go, well, I'm not equal to him. Okay, that guy is, 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 is he is a monster uh, when it comes to, to, to hitting the baseball. And that applies to every domain. There are people who are very good. But in America, we say that doesn't matter. There's a moral aspect in which we are all equal, and, and I, I fully believe that. But if you're standing outside of that narrative, it looks very foolish. And I think... Compromises, political compromises in democracies happen within these narratives, and I think that's going to get progressively more difficult. And not just compromises, but even organizing a program, reforming the system, uh, changing anything, moving in any direction, it's going to become progressively more difficult because the basically the nakedness of the emperor is, is always going to be very visible to the public. It seems like you might therefore just be chalking up some of the uh, last two years in Washington stagnation type of issues as an inability to share a narrative because everyone's had their nerves destroyed and rebuilt and but no one is sharing the same narrative. Well, I mean, I, it's kind of funny because I, I have um, I have noticed that that President Obama likes the idea of narratives a lot. I'm not sure he has a clue what he means by that, but but um, he talks that up a lot. I actually think. Well, you know, I, Washington, I live in Washington, uh, and I, I worked in Washington my entire life, and I, I, God prevent me from trying to explain it, okay? Um, <laughs> but, but I actually think if you're going to exp- try to come up with an analysis of the, um, the last few years and, and the level of inaction beyond the obvious fact that, um, the politics are divided so equally that it's hard to get anything across one from one side to the other. I think it, the fact that the president himself, Barack Obama, has taken uh, a turn that is probably quite different from those, that of any other president I, I, I'm aware of that is very consistent with the attitude of the public. And we can talk about that a little bit if you want. What You mean it's, you think that he is merging with the narrative? Basically, President Obama – after uh, his electoral defeat in 2010, went back to being his, what I consider to be his true voice. I mean, for, between 2008 and 2010, he was sort of LBJ. He was sort of FDR. He wanted to foster these big programs to solve these big uh, problems. Um, but the real Obama, the one that existed before that, was essentially a man who was against. 
He was against the Iraq war. He was against the Democratic establishment that, that, that Hillary Clinton represented. And of course, he ran in 2008 in complete repudiation of, of the Bush legacy. In 2010, he sort of assumed that voice where he became essentially accuser in chief is what I call him. He became somebody who felt that his job as, a, as an old community organizer was to point for example, that people were trampling on, on women's rights or that our economic equality was declining. And while presidents in the past have, have made these sort of charges, that's usually in, in preface to, and now this is what I intend to do about it. Here is my program to solve this issue. And that's what never happens with this administration. He is really, he is really a, a sectarian prophet. He just wants to, uh, or he, seem, he seems to find his job in, Pointing attention, being a voice uh, for the for the wrongs that he sees in society, versus that somebody who's an expert in policy or programs or pol- even politics. I don't think he's a particularly adept politician. I wanted to shift gears a bit um, to the Arab Spring specifically, because in the in the first part of your book, you spend quite a lot of time talking about the uprisings throughout the Arab world and use them. Specifically, the uh, specifically Egypt to kind of show how a lot of these things play out, um, how how these the the public can become very quickly organized around something, um, how social media plays in. You talk about the role of of imagery in provoking these things, and then how governments try to address this this fifth wave change often very badly and only make things worse. So. I was hoping maybe you could tell us a bit of that story because I found it pretty interesting. Well, um, basically, this, if, we go to, if you move to Egypt to begin with, um, you have uh, a movement that, is, that, that began as a Facebook event. Okay? Uh, a young man, he was 29 at the time, called Wael Ghanim, uh, set up a page, a Facebook page called We Are All Khaled Said. Now, Khaled Said was, um, I guess he was a person, he was uh, an event, and he was an image. He was a, a, another young man who had been very brutally um, beaten to death by basically the thugs in, in, in the employ of Hosni Mubarak's regime. Um, what, what, transpired with this particular case was that his family went to the morgue and secretly took uh, uh, cell phone photos of his incredibly mangled appearance. And the contrast, he was a very handsome young man and there are photos of him smiling and the contrast between this handsome young man in his living photos and this horrible image uh, was basically the centerpiece of the We're All Khaled Saeed um, Facebook event. In that in, in, in that page, uh, he invited for police day in Egypt, January 25, people to come out uh, to Tahrir Square uh, in Cairo. Um, that um, There were a million people who viewed that, and there were 100,000 that said, yes, I'm going to show up. Now, whether they did or not, that's, that's a mystery. But the fact is, when he showed up, he lived in Dubai. That's another thing. He didn't even leave it, live in, in, in Egypt. He lived in Dubai. He was... Uh, marketing head for Google, um, and he was conducting this revolution in Egypt from another country. He did go to Egypt. He showed up, and there were, of course, the, the crowds had arrived, uh, and 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 very much uh, yeah, once once the, uh, the, the 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 movement hit the streets, t- took a life of its own. Um, part of the reason he had scheduled that that. Uh, um, demonstration for January 25 was what had transpired in, in Syria, where another young man uh, called uh, Mohammed Bouazizi had essentially been felt himself humiliated. He had been insulted by a woman in the employ of the, that particular uh, authoritarian government uh, of a man called Ben Ali. Um, and he was so distraught that he doused himself in gasoline and, and burned himself alive. And there are photos, there are photos of that. There's two images out of Khaled Salid and Mohammed Bouazizi that stand at the origin of the Arab Spring. Um, and of course, three weeks after the demonstrations got started because of this event, uh, the dictator in, in Tunisia was gone. This in turn inspired uh, 
the Egyptian whales going need to try the same thing in Egypt in, on Facebook. It worked. Um, basically, none of these, none of these um, sort of self-assemblies of the public would have been possible uh, without the conditions of the fifth wave. All of them appeared to the people in authority to be like suddenly a materialization of people from nowhere. There's like suddenly one day there was nobody. Another day there are 100,000 people on the square. In fact, they were all planned pretty carefully and at length on Facebook or other uh, digital platforms. It's just that the hierarchies of government tend not to pay attention to that. Those are not important outlets. So I think part of what I, the, the, the clash uh, that, that the Arab Spring illustrates, and, and that, of course, the same thing happened in, uh, in Syria, where um, it, the conditions were different. You had no, um, no access to mass media there because the government was far uh, more totalitarian. Um, but they could put out YouTube videos of the, of the crowds and the size of the demonstrations. You could tell these were very large crowds. And then you could put out YouTube videos of the repression. So you could tell the bad things were happening there. So there was no way that governments, even a, uh, an aspiring totalitarian government like uh, Bashar Assad's in Syria, no way that he could close the borders to information. I think the information sphere is larger than any, um, any government. And of course, in Egypt, Mubarak's tried, I mean, this is an old man's mistake. He thought that if he switched off the internet somehow or another, um, the demonstrations would lose their voice. But uh, the information sphere, part of the point I make in my book, this talk of new media and old media, it's kind of, it's useful at a certain level, but what really matters is the fact that all of these media have matrix into a gigantic and redundant sphere and it's completely out of the control of any government. So switching up the internet really did very little in terms of uh, taking away the public's voice. And if you compare that to Tiananmen Square in China in, in 1989, you see a very different story because there the information was controlled and then squelched and, and it wasn't democratized in that way. The Chinese had walls, if I remember correctly. They had walls where they would post their proclamations. And they were, they were a little bit like blogs, I guess. But they were li- literally physical walls. Uh, and, of course, if you are a policeman, you can see what's being put on the walls. And it, it is not a big mystery. And, I mean, the, the Chinese government during, uh, during the Tahrir Square uh, uprising filtered out the word Egypt from its inter- you could not I mean, search- You mean the Egyptian government during the Tahrir Square? No, I mean the Chinese. Oh, you mean the Chinese in China. Okay, okay. Yeah. The Chinese- if you were a, uh, a person in China and you wanted to search on Egypt, you could not. Hmm. They, co- they considered that to be a very alarming thing that was happening there. I mean the Chinese are on the brink. They are on the brink. The, all, all the things that I'm talking about are events that have happened and I am not prophetic, so I'm not going to say they will happen here or there. But if you look at what uh, – the, the, the Mubarak regime was not that much more incompetent than the Chinese regime. All these governments are on the brink. So is there anything inherently libertarian about this? I mean libertarians are going to be pretty excited about anything that undercuts state authority. But that doesn't mean that anything that replaces it is going to be necessarily better or less authoritarian. But So should libertarians be generally happy about these developments? Um, I have been kind of surprised by how the book has been so well received by libertarians. I, 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 I'm sort of like a – um, a man without a label. Unfortunately, I, I I always find reasons to argue with myself. So whenever I think I'm something, I end up being something else. So I am not a libertarian, um, and the book was not particularly intended as a libertarian uh, tract, but um, it speaks to the failure of government, and it speaks to the ba- the fact that government is failing in a very open way. In, in the past, go- government could fail much more discreetly than today, um, and it speaks to. Um, the self-organization of the public, and in the past, the public found it impossible to organize without a structure, without a hierarchy, without a mass movement or, or a party of some sort. Um, and I guess those are, um, as I understand libertarianism, which I mostly don't, uh, I guess those would be um, sympathetic to that point of view. I think in the end, you have to replace something with something. My concern is that we're trying to replace something with nothing, and, and I don't know how that could be. And, and that's sort of the way that, 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 that the trend 
uh, of a very uh, negation obsessed public and a very um, failure prone uh, uh, government. Uh, that collision between the two where we're headed. Well, perhaps one of the lessons is is that m- more mass centralization or, or centralization of many groups of people together uh, who have many access to different information, different narratives, different different types of information. It's not going to work if you try and get them all to centralize together. But maybe they can govern themselves on a smaller level, possibly. I think that is absolutely the case, and I think that that. The, um, there is a um, a book called "Seeing Like a State" by uh, a very brilliant James C. Scott. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's a brilliant book. Okay, and much of many of my insights were, frankly, stolen from his because you, once you think it best, there's no point of getting any better. Um, and I think he he um, describes what he calls a high modernist temper, which is what you say, is centralizing, is programmatic, is everything under a gigantic umbrella. And we deal with these huge, what they call problems, which are really social conditions, for example, uh, economic underdevelopment or unemployment. That is, to call it a problem makes it ma- sound like a mathematical equation. In fact, it's just a condition. But, but there is some gigantic, colossal expenditure of political power, theoretically bringing in scientific know-how that's going to, quote, solve this problem. That's high modernism at work. We have inherited that rhetoric. I mean, we are way beyond high modernism. Nobody believes in much of that anymore. But our rhetoric, our political rhetoric, it still speaks in terms of those gigantic problems and gigantic solutions. Obama very much talked that way. So did Bush. And I think, yes, uh, the first step towards good health in a democracy is to step away from this uh, gigantism <laughs> and, and, and to, to understand that most knowledge happens in the, in the personal sphere, happens locally. Uh, most uh, uh, direct... Uh, causal effects happen in that sphere when you're dealing with uh, governments at, 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 at the level of the hundreds of millions of people unintended effects almost always swamp whatever your intentions are when you're dealing with yourself as an individual or your community as, as a small group where you, you're face to face and you, you know that if there's a job opening you can apply for it and you get a job so that is a very direct cause and effect if we have a 7% level of unemployment and there is a program to fix that, you have no idea how that works. What are you to do about that? Uh, you are basically swamped by unintended effects. And if you look at, uh, if I may plug another book that I think is, is fundamental and has not gotten nearly enough uh, play, brilliant book uh, called Why Most Things Fail by uh, Paul Ormerod, uh, a British economist. Basically, uh, he makes, uh, he's a stat- among other things, a, a, a very brilliant statistician. He makes a, a really excellent statistical case that almost everyone, at every level of human life, we mostly fail, all right? Um, but at certain levels, we can do trial and error and kind of correct that. But the problem with government is that it, it accumulates failure. It, it's a system that accumulates noise and becomes more and more fragile as it does that. Because to accept failure is political death. So you have the system that fails constantly and is unable to move beyond that. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.